My name is Peter McCown. I'm the Vice Principal for Public Engagement here at Queen Mary. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce this uh, most recent video in the Magic at My Lens series. Colin Mulcahy, who's a, a friend of mine and also a practicing math magician, uh, has just recently produced a book called Card Tricks 52 New Effects. And in the talk that we're about to see, he's going to tell you a little bit about some of the mathematical creativity that went into producing them. So uh, here he is with his amazing mathematical magic, my friend Colin. Thank you very much, Matt. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming out on a lovely summer's evening. I know you can probably think of more exciting things you'd rather be doing. It's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to speak in London, and especially in a series that had such distinguished speakers as Art Benjamin and Brent Morris earlier this year. Ironically, the last time I was in London, uh, I took a gentleman out for a drink who was one of the geniuses of British magic and mathematical magic, and that was the late Alex Elmsley. I took him out for a drink, it turned out to be five or six drinks, and uh, he drank me under the table, basically. But uh, he was another brilliant mind in the 50s and 60s and 70s who did stuff on perfect shuffles, the mathematics and computer science of perfect shuffles. I'd like to thank the organizers for making it possible for me to be here. And we're going to have a little fun. I'm going to start off, actually, can we dim the lights a little bit for this part? Thanks. Um, I'm going to start off with a trick which uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about, there's about five tricks I'm going to go through. And they are to be found, for the most part, in a forthcoming volume, this big fat book, which is coming out in a couple of weeks. There's some flyers you may have seen on the way in. And uh, there's a flyer that will be available on your way out only, which explains one of the tricks in great detail. They're actually all available on the web, free, if you wish to look them up. Uh, the thing to look out for is my name. And uh, this is my Twitter handled card column. If you just Google the phrase card column, you will find a web page at the Mathematical Association of America. It's been running for about nine years, and all of the stuff I've come up with over the years is there freely available. The first one, however, is not on the web, and that's the Father Ted card trick. So uh, it's kind of a new creation, and special maybe to an audience that appreciates Father Ted. So is there anybody here who's a big Father Ted fan? Ah, we have a Father Ted fan in the front row. What's your name? Sandra. Sandra. Right, Sandra. Excellent. Well, here we have some... Uh, Famous Father Ted characters, uh, Mrs. Doyle, Father Dougal, Father Ted, and uh, the ever-elegant and dapper Father Jack. And I'm going to ask you to decide which of these four is your favorite, and shout it out. Father Jack. Father Jack. You're going to go for Father Jack. Okay. So here we have four different cards, and uh, these are obviously special cards that uh, I had made up. What we're going to do now is take some cards, shuffle them, and uh, see what happens. So let's see. I'm going to show you these cards. You can see that they're all different cards, right? They're not the same. It would kind of be a boring trick if they were all the same. Um, we are going to uh, mix up these cards. And uh, you're going to tell me when to stop mixing. And then we're going to spell out Father Jack three times. OK, you're happy. OK, so here we go. Father Jack, F-A-T-H-E-R-J-A-C-K. We drop the rest on top. We do it twice more. And I should have asked you, have you done magic before? You've never done magic. Well, that'll be interesting. Um, F-A-T-H-E-R-J-A-C-K. I did say we do it three times. We'll always do it three times. So final time, F-A-T-H-E-R-J-A-C-K. Hopefully all is well. Now, I am going to uh, come over and have you press down hard on the top card and turn it into Father Jack, okay. just the top card. And this is based on mathematics, I promise you. Okay, so with any luck, uh, that should be Father Jack. Now, before we take a look, uh, the top card would obviously be this one here. I'm not cheating. No sleight of hand. Um, here we have uh, the cards, which I showed you earlier. And what was on the other sides? Do you remember when I flipped them over? They were just red, right, the backs of the cards. But actually, they've changed into various different cards here. And clearly, there is Jack. I mean, Jack would have to be a Jack, right? What else could he be? So let's see if her card matches this. If it does, some math and magic has just happened. I'd like you to give her a round of applause. So here we go. Let's give it a try. <laughs> now, that's not a reproducible trick for you unless you have the cards I have. I had a friend make up some cards with the Father Jack character images. But I'm going to present the same trick from a completely different perspective. The mathematics is identical. The presentation is very different. That you can reproduce at home. So I need somebody, maybe somebody young who really likes ice cream. 
This young man likes ice cream. Would you come down, please? And uh, we'll try something out here. Okay. So, you like ice cream. What is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Chocolate. Chocolate. And what's your name? Kira. Okay. So, shuffle up those cards. Make sure they're good and shuffled. No cheating whatsoever. Shuffle up those cards. And um, they're good and shuffled, right? Okay. Can I have them back? So you're going to get three scoops of chocolate ice cream and three toppings. And uh, you know the counting out and dropping is the same as before. It's just that we don't have Father Jack anymore. So three scoops, chocolate, you said. Now, there's some mathematics involved. Chocolate has how many letters? Nine or ten? Ten, I think, right? So double that number. You get 18 or 20. We need at least ten cards to make sure we have enough to spell the word chocolate. We don't want more than twice that. So we're going to take around a quarter of the deck. 14, 15 cards will be fine. So I'm guessing that's about a quarter of the deck. That's certainly enough for, um, for chocolate. So I might have a little more, too many here. I'll throw a few away. So tell me when to stop mixing the cards. I'm mixing the cards up here. Stop. stop. Okay, three scoops of chocolate. Here we go. C-H-O-C-O-L-A-T-E. First scoop, first topping. C-H-O-C-O-L-A-T-E. Second scoop, second topping. No sleight of hand. Here we go. C H O C O L A T E. Now, Kieran, have you done magic before? Uh, kind of. A little bit. Oh, well, he's probably an old pro at this. Press down hard on the top card, please, and turn it into the Jack of Diamonds. Flip it over. Is it the Jack of Diamonds? It's the Jack of Diamonds. Thank you. <laughs> now, the other cards are all different. I mean, if they were all the Jack of Diamonds, it would be a different kind of a card trick. So let's talk about how this uh, can be done. And this was actually invented in the spring of 2003 when I was living in Spain for a little while. But the inspiration for all of this, for a lot of people who do this kind of stuff, is a gentleman I'm going to tell you a little bit about here before we go into the mathematical explanation. About six or seven years ago, I went to Oklahoma to see a man who was well into his 90s. And uh, his name was Martin Gardner, and he's very famous for popularizing mathematics and magic in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, noughties, and uh, he died in 2010. So he actually had a career of publishing that spanned about 80 years. He wrote for 80 years on mathematics, magic, physics, and various other subjects. He wrote for Scientific American, and uh, that's how a lot of people know his writings. But I had the good fortune to meet him a few times towards the end of his life, and he, he has written so many wonderful things about magic and mathematics, the interaction. So that trick that I just showed you in the ice cream flavor version was actually dedicated to him on his 90th birthday, which was 2004. But the first time I went to see him, um, he said to me, uh, I've got a tall skinny glass here. And he produced this tall skinny glass. And he asked me how much higher I thought the glass was than its circumference. And looking at it, it seemed like it was maybe one and a half or two times taller than it was around. After all, it was a tall glass and it was a skinny glass. And then, you know, he got me to agree that that was probably the case. And then he took out a little piece of paper as a measuring tape, unmeasured, un unnumbered, and he, he, it, was, it was as tall as a glass, and he tried to wrap it around one or two times, and it didn't even go around once. So our perception of girth is flawed, deeply flawed. And anybody who puts on weight as they get older looks in the mirror, they're always in denial for the same reason. We just don't appreciate girth at all. So, uh, you know, it's all about pi, really, when you think about it, because um, the... Circumference is pi times the diameter for a cylinder. So, um, you know, memorizing digits of pi, I'm not so impressed with. If you don't have an instinct about the real meaning of pi, uh, maybe the digits aren't so important. So, a uh, classic illusion, which Martin demonstrated to me with uh, this tall skinny glass. It's actually hard to find a glass that's taller than it is around the circumference. It really has to be, you know, 3.14159 times as tall as it is wide. It's pretty hard to find a glass that tall. So Martin Gardner, I call him the Prince of Recreational Mathematics. He lived from 1914 to 2010. And this photograph I took of him just because uh, every book on that bookshelf he wrote. Most of us haven't read that many books in a lifetime. He wrote that many books in a lifetime. And in fact, there are two more shelves below the belt that you can't see. There's four visible and there's two more below the level of his belt. So um, in his retirement community, he, he kind of divested himself of most of his worldly goods, but he did keep a few things that obsessed him, the writings of G.K. Chesterton, the writings of Lord Dunsany, uh, Lewis Carroll, and, well, he obviously kept the stuff he wrote. But that's how much stuff he wrote, and that was 2006, and he actually wrote four or five books between that and his passing. Next year, of course, will be his 100th birthday, and there are going to be worldwide celebrations uh, in connection with him, because he left a lot of terrific resources for 
engaging young people in problem solving, creative thinking, logical thinking, rational thinking, skepticism, Lewis Carroll, maths, magic, and so on. Anyway, back to the ice cream trick. By the way, he's on Twitter. <laughs> I promise me, I promise, trust you, uh, he's on Twitter. So if you're, if you're on Twitter, follow him, WWMGT. What would Martin Gardner tweet? He has over a thousand followers, and we like to keep up a high quality flow of tweets uh, about the things he was interested in, including chess and other things, optical illusions and so on. So the three scoop miracle, okay, the Father Ted incarnation I'll get back to, but the three scoop miracle works like this. I asked somebody to shout out an ice cream flavor. By extraordinary coincidence, chocolate was named. In this part of the world, uh, about, I would say 80% of the time, people say chocolate, vanilla, or strawberry. And those all have around eight, nine, 10 letters. So if you have a quarter of the deck, it's guaranteed, well, the magic is guaranteed to happen. So you spell out the, the word, thereby reversing the cards at the top of the deck, and then you drop the rest on top. And I call that a topping sometimes, you know, a scoop and a topping. And you do it three times in total, and something magic happens. Well, think about the two incarnations. The first one was about, you know, a Father Ted character. But in both cases, I had somebody press down on the top card. And in one case, it turned into the card that matched Father Jack, very conveniently. In the second case, it turned, uh, I said to the young man, Kieran, I said, turn it into, and I pretended to make up the game of a card. Oh, the Jack of Diamonds. Of course, it had to be the Jack of Diamonds. I knew it was going to be the Jack of Diamonds. In spite of the randomness of the flavor called out, the fact that I didn't know exactly how many cards I had, the fact that I shuffled them right in front of your eyes. So what is going on here? Well, let me show you two again. So um, if I say to you, look, I'm going to shuffle these cards, tell me when to stop. I mean, I am mixing up the cards a fair bit, right? So tell me when to stop. OK, I'm quite happy stopping there. Why do you think I'm happy? even though I've just rearranged the cards, and I couldn't possibly know where the cards are that I've just rearranged. The bottom card is still the bottom card. Actually, I made a point of making it not the bottom card in both of the real incarnations, and I should have done it there, because what I generally do is you peek at the bottom card. The bottom card will come to the top. The mathematics guarantees that. And in the case of Father Jack, I just made sure he was near the bottom, and when she said Jack, I got him on the bottom. If she'd said Ted, I'd have got Ted on the bottom. Whoever I need, you know, the bottom card will come to the top because of mathematics. We'll come back to that in a minute. So in showbiz sense, you have the bottom card, but you don't want people to know that you've peeked at it. So, you know, typically, Kieran was standing here, I was shuffling the cards, and I just peeked at the last minute before we went into the deal. So I just took a sideways steel peek. I didn't flash it for you to see, but I peeked it. So in this case, it's the Ten of Hearts. But then, if I'm doing it properly, I would say, let me mix up these cards. And I immediately put the Ten of Hearts on top, hold it there with my thumb. And I might even say, look, the cards are all different. And I show you most of the cards. I probably don't want you to see the Ten of Hearts, because I don't want you to remember that later. But you see most of the cards. You see they're different. You don't see the Ten of Hearts. It'll come back later. It's at the top now. I close up the fan. I do more shuffling. My thumb's on it. I put it at the bottom. There it is, the bottom. And then I say, tell me when to stop. And I just mix up the rest. And it doesn't matter when you tell me to stop, because the one I want to be on the bottom is indeed on the bottom where it needs to be. The bottom card is guaranteed to come to the top with three deals of the type described. And that seems to be a new discovery. So let's talk about the maths there. So you say, you know, any ice cream flavor could have been used, and then you say, turn it into a specific card. And of course, it's a card that you've planted there. As I mentioned, this was published uh, back on Martin's 90th birthday, which was uh, in October 2004, as Low Down Triple Dealing. And that's the, what I call it, and it's available on the web freely. You can get it from there. Now, what's really going on is, remember I said chocolate had 10 letters, 9 or 10 letters. I needed to have at least 9 or 10 cards and no more than 18 or 20. If somebody says mint, which they say in California a lot, I've discovered, as their favorite ice cream flavor. Half the people in California seem to like mint. It's a very short word, it's only four letters. So you'd have to use between four and eight cards, which is a little too small. So I usually make them say mint chocolate or something. And if somebody says mint chocolate, double chip, raspberry, granola bar, well then you need about three decks of cards. So you want to cut down on the amount of dealing you're going to do. So, but almost everybody in this part of the world says chocolate uh, or raspberry, or uh, if somebody says rum, I, I make them say rum raisin. So uh, for vanilla, we would have, there's the 10, right? So vanilla, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I need at least seven cards, but no more than 14. I've got way too many cards here. 
this would not be a good idea for vanilla. It wouldn't work. So uh, I usually have the whole deck to start with, and you know, I do something that people don't generally remark on. I take the cards I want from the bottom rather than the top. The reason being that I peeked at the bottom card. I need to know the bottom card. If you can peek at a top card, you can get it to the bottom later. If you have some magic skills, there are other ways to deal with this. But it's almost above board. I think it's 95% mathematical, or 5%, little hocus pocus. So I peek at the bottom card, and I can steal a glance at that fairly easily without you knowing. Usually I hold the cards like this, and the audience is there, and I can glance over here and I see it. I can even switch it and see it again. It's now the Six of Clubs. And you don't know what it is. And you probably don't know that I know it's the Six of Clubs. So let's go for vanilla. So I would take off 10 or 11 cards for vanilla. I would mix them up. I would flash them to you. You don't see the one I want. It's back on the bottom now. Vanilla. V-A-N-I-L-L-A. -L now it's on the bottom, right? So it's going in at the, bot at the bottom of the first topping. Again, V-A-N-I-L-L-A. -L -L -A. At this point, it's somewhere in there. Not quite sure. Not worried. It's coming back. Here we go. V-A-N-I-L-L-A. -L -L -A. It should be the top card. I said it was the six of clubs. There it is, the six of clubs. So it works like clockwork. Let's take a look at why. Now, there are many different ways to analyze the maths of this. We'll take a look at a couple here. First of all, you can track everything. If you think of the cards as numbered from 1, 2, 3, down to K, well, suppose that you're spelling out, uh, you, have, you have N cards and you're spelling out K of them. So K is the length of the flavor. So for chocolate, it's whatever. Chocolate is nine letters, I think. And N would be between 18 and 9. So typically, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15. When you deal out the top view and reverse, you can actually track exactly what's going on. And it gets a little harder to track the second deal and the third deal, but there are ways to figure out what's going on. First of all, we want the length of the ice cream flavor to be at least half the packet size, or if you like, the packet size to be um, less than twice the length of the ice cream flavor. And the point is, the bottom card always comes to the top after three deals and drops. You're dealing out and dropping, dealing out a scoop of ice cream and putting a topping on it. It's two steps. So why? And can you generalize it? Now, if there's some maths that makes the bottom card come to the top, maybe there's some kind of dual maths that makes the top card go to the bottom. And uh, that I only figured out recently, but in fact, it can be done. It's, it's a different move, but uh, there is a kind of a duality here. If you can make the bottom card come to the top, there's a similar kind of accounting spelling thing you can do that makes the other one go the other direction. Well, um, actually, the easiest way to analyze it is to break up the packet. You've got a packet that starts one at the top, two, three, four, five, six, all the way down to N. You break it up into three packets. It's actually a symmetric break in the sense that the top and the bottom have the same size. So I use M for the middle, T for the top, B for the bottom. And the sizes are given by those numbers. And those three numbers, if you add them up, stuff cancels. They do add up to N. And it turns out that the dealing out and dropping corresponds to a little maths kind of operation where the top, middle, bottom becomes the bottom, well, the bottom goes back on the top at the end, and the other two are reversed in order. So the hats are, are bars over the letters indicate reversal of order of the cards. So the original top part of the deck ends up on the bottom, reversed. The original middle part ends up in the middle, reversed. And the original bottom ends up on the top, not reversed. And if you symbolize it that way, then it's pretty easy to see what happens after three of those. And you can check that uh, with three moves, the bottom goes to the top. Something even more interesting happens, which is a little surprising. And that is, um, well, think for a second. If I get this card back on top after three scoops, what would happen if I did a fourth one? It would go right back on the bottom, and then I would spell out vanilla, V-A-N-I-L-L-A. -L -L so four will certainly take the bottom card to the bottom. Actually, it takes everything back to where it started. The operation has period four. Uh, flipping a card over has period two. If you do it twice, you're back to where you started. This is a more complicated operation. It, it has a cycle periodicity of four. And that means, if you know a little algebra, there's a way to describe how to rearrange things using something called cycle decomposition permutations. Um, this permutation must be a product of two cycles and four cycles. Uh, maybe the four cycles are interesting, so you can uh, analyze that. Now, mint chocolate chip uh, um, has the property that three different lengths of word are used, obviously. But uh, mint is four letters and chocolate is uh, nine. And four plus nine is, what, uh, 13. 
So actually, with a packet of 12 cards, uh, you know, 10, 11, 12 cards, if you spell out mint chocolate chip like this, uh, let's look at the bottom card again. It's the six of uh, clubs. M-I-N-T, drop. Chocolate, right? C-H-O-C-O-L-A-T-E. We haven't done this before. We're using different lengths. But then the third time I use the same length, because chip happens to have the same length as mint. M-I-N-T. Look what's on top. Oh. That's supposed to be a six. <laughs> I must have mis miscounted. So there's actually generalizations that are somewhat surprising. It's, it's just the tip of the iceberg, really. There's a lot of similar uh, tricks you can get, and some interesting maths arises. Okay, let's try something a little different. So again, the Father Ted trick is basically the same thing, except I have to use special cards. I have cards that have uh, you know, the pictures in the front, and they're aligned particularly. I mean, Ted is a king, and Mrs. Doyle is, of course, the only queen, and Dougal is a joker, and Jack is a jack. So that's just um, you know, an implementation that, unless you have a friend who can make these for you, the cards might be a little harder. By the way, uh, some cards were distributed at the top of the room earlier. I don't know if you noticed them. Um, these are the latest in a set. E every year, in honor of Martin Gardner, um, a designer called Scott Kim, who was actually championed by Martin Gardner back in the 70s and 80s, is a brilliant graphic designer. He comes up with these things called ambigrams, which read one way in this direction and read a different way when you flip them over. So this it says Martin Gardner's Celebration of Mind, which is the name of an annual celebration every October in his honor. And they happen all over the world, including here in the UK. If you turn that upside down, however, it says something different. It says puzzles, premonitions, and probabilities. So the script is such that it says one thing one way and one thing the other way. That's quite a talent to be able to do that. I met David Singmaster uh, last night, who is a puzzle collector who lives here in London. And he said that uh, he asked Scott Kim if he could do something like that with his name. And he said he looked into the distance for about three minutes, took out a pen, and did it perfectly, first time, just did it. He wrote out David Singmaster in such a way that when you turned it upside down, it still said David Singmaster. Extraordinary how somebody could, I mean, I would have thought that would have taken them weeks to develop. He just did it in a few minutes. Um, so again, uh, again, it says, um, it says Martin Gardner's Celebration of Mind, and this way it says uh, puzzles, premonition, and probabilities. So again, it says Martin Gardner's Celebration of Mind, but if you turn it over, oops, it's changed. It says magic, mathematics, and mystery united. Well, uh, what's going on here is that we actually have two different ones. I pulled a slide fast one on you there. Um, if you see them side by side, there's color differences and slight script differences. But they both say Martin Gardner's Celebration of Mind. The script is different. So they say the same thing this way. And when you turn them upside down, they say something, which is amazing, but they say something different. One says magic, mathematics, and mystery united, and the other says puzzles, premonitions, and improbabilities. This is two of a set of four. Every year he comes out with a new one. And I guess he's going to do this forever. Pretty impressive. But you only have the one that's, the one you have is brand new. It just came out two weeks ago. Nobody has seen it yet. You're probably the first audience to get it. OK, let's try something different. And this uh, is something that involves a type of mathematics that most of you will have heard of. Uh, you may not have seen this version of it before. So this is one where I'm going to need uh, two volunteers who are very good at addition. You're going to have to add up numbers. Now, of course, I'm going to have you add up card numbers. Look at this amazing coincidence. There's that six again. Um, so you're going to pick two cards, and the basic idea is to add up the numbers. So if these are the two cards, you would, of course, say 10, right? If uh, these are the two cards, you would say 17. In addition, I want you to memorize the cards you get. I'm not going to see them. Only you will see the cards. You have to memorize the suit and number and report to me the total. So uh, an ace counts as one. So an ace and a 10, you would say a total of 11. Now, we need a convention for jack, queen, and king. Since a jack comes right after a 10, the convention is it's worth 11. A queen is worth 12, and a king is, of course, worth 13. So two kings, you know, 26 would be the total. What would a queen and a 7 be? Queen and a 7? 18. OK, so you got the idea, right? So I need uh, two volunteers who are very good at addition. These gentlemen in the front row, I suspect, are stellar at addition. <laughs> you have some help. OK. So. Hold on a sec. Um, hold on a sec. 
something. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to pick two cards and uh, add up the numbers and tell me what the numbers are. And then I'm going to set up a little timer here. And as soon as you tell me the numbers, I'm going to... This is a little rail and, and, a, and a ball bearing. And it's going to slide down the rail. And, you know, gravity is fairly strong in this part of London. So um, I'm going to name the cards before the ball gets to the bottom. That's, that's my goal, right? Let's see if I can do this. It's never been done before. First time. I just bought that today. Okay. So first of all, uh, shout out a number four, five, or six. Um, one of you shout out a number, four, five, or six? Five. Five, okay, so we're going to take off five cards. One, two, three, four, five. We're going to mix these up. I'm going to close my eyes at this point, so I couldn't possibly tell where anything is or anything like that. Tell me when to stop. Okay, stop. So now you pick one card. <laughs> I, whatever, you mix them up, I don't care. You happy? Okay. Pick one card, yeah, and then you pick one card. Oh, no, pick me. Okay, give me back the ones you didn't pick. You each have one? I have three, good. So now, look at and remember the cards, and then add up the numbers, and don't tell me the total yet. Both, both, both. You both look at the cards and remember them, number one. Yeah. Number two, compare, add up the numbers. I'm going to ask you in a few minutes when I step back there what the total is. And I want you to hide your cards in here. So hide one card there, and hide the other card there. Okay, now, um, so... Uh, I want you to tell me what the total is when I say go, okay? I'm going to shout out the total. And the cards are in here, so uh, I'm going to name them or find them or both um, in the space, the length of time it takes that ball bearing to roll down, okay? So you ready to shout out the number? You ready? Okay. <laughs> Your cards were um, nine. Oh, they're interesting, same color. In fact, some would say the same suit. Would you like me to find them? Would that be somewhat impressive? Well, I'll just tell you what they are. Um, so nine could be obviously a four and a five, a six and a three, two four and a half, a 10 and a minus one. I'm going with the ace of clubs and the eight of clubs. Am I right? Thank you. I paid good money for this not to go fast. <laughs> Let's try it again. I tried it earlier here and it didn't do that. <laughs> I'm determined to get my 20 pounds worth for this. Okay, it's obviously the gravity is extra strong tonight. <laughs> it, it actually moves very slowly. It's one of those weird things that kind of defies gravity. Um, like Father Dougal. Okay. So, I obviously knew what the two cards were, so the obvious question is, what could be going on there? You, you picked two cards at random, you told me the sum, and I knew what they were. Now, a nine, a nine could arise in many ways. It could have been a three and a six, it could have been a five <coughs> and a four. Not only was I able to tell you what the cards were, apparently I knew the suit as well. So, what could be going on there? Interesting question. Well, uh, the good news is that when you leave here today, you will have a piece of paper. It will be white rather than yellow but it's up at the top of the room by the end of the talk, and it explains this in great detail. But I'm going to tell you about it now as well. But this is a souvenir you can take home. So you shuffle the deck of cards a few times, and you invite people to take two or three cards. We had two done this time. It would have worked with three or four. Their results are shared with each other, and I am told the total. And from the total, I know what each individual card is. Well, this is based on a mathematical principle that's not so well known. And that is, when several numbers are added up, you know what they all were just by knowing the total. This is not, I don't remember learning this in school. Did you learn this in school? Well, that's secret number one. Now, I had the idea for this card trick in January 2007 while teaching a class and teaching a topic that I didn't really like, but it was in the book and I thought, well, I'll do it, but I'm not that impressed. It's a famous maths topic and I've never thought much of it. And now I think it's the best maths topic in the world. So what could it be? Well, secret number two. Um, I said you can take any cards uh, from the deck. But actually, uh, this is how I shuffled. Uh, I said I was going to shuffle the cards at the beginning. Now watch what happens here, right? I'm shuffling the cards. Is that an honest shuffle? It looked reasonably honest, right? Um, just by my saying the word honest shuffle, most of you believe me, I would empty your wallets in my direction immediately. But is it an honest shuffle? What's going on? 
the top, I'm controlling the top seven or eight cards. So I'm shuffling most of them. Now, of course, I didn't show you that angle the first time around, right? If I say, let me shuffle the cards, and I do this, most of you think, what an honest looking guy, he's shuffling the cards. But actually, the top cards are still the cards I want them to be. So I know what the top six cards are. And then I said, shout out a number four, five, or six. Window dressing, it's irrelevant. I will end up with four or five or six of six cards that I have planted there at the beginning and memorized suits and values. Now, what could these magic cards be? What magic numbers have the property that if you add up two of them, you will automatically know what they must be? Well, powers of two would work, like one, two, four, H. But that's only four. And that's kind of boring and a little obvious. If it's always powers of two, people will catch on. Because everything can be written uniquely in terms of powers of two. But there's another uh, set of numbers that have that property, and they're very famous. Primes? Primes won't work. Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci numbers. It turns out that the Fibonacci numbers have that property. Something I did not know until I was teaching from a wonderful book called The Heart of Mathematics by Starbird and Berger, which I highly recommend. It's a very different approach to mathematics. You can use it with kind of extra talented students at any age. A lot of fun stuff in there. And it's called the Zeckendorf representation. And it was discovered by a very interesting man called Edward Zeckendorf, who was a Belgian um, army doctor. And he discovered this in 1939. And the fact is that every whole number, bigger than one, can be written in one and, one, and only one way uh, in terms of uh, these magic numbers, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. And in fact, look at the first few of them there. Those are the ones that I wanted. One, an ace, a two, a three, a five, an eight, and a king. Once you get to 21, you're beyond the reach of a deck of cards. So we don't use that. You could with pieces of paper. But for card magic, it, you get six Fibonacci numbers up to 13, which is very nice. So you memorize a particular ace, two, three, five, eight, and king, and you're good to go. The story of uh, Zeckendorf is quite fascinating. I'd never heard of him until 2007. Um, he was an amateur mathematician and uh, an army doctor, and he was actually imprisoned in a German prison of war camp in 1939 and spent almost six years in there. Extraordinary. Uh, got out alive and later switched to being a dentist for the Belgian army and didn't publish it until he retired in 1972. The Fibonacci Quarterly hadn't heard of it. All these people who do Fibonacci numbers were completely oblivious to it. An incredibly nice, simple uh, elegant, beautiful fact about Fibonacci numbers that had been missed in hundreds and hundreds of years, of hundreds and thousands of people studying Fibonacci numbers. Amazing. This amateur discovered it. Actually, somebody published it in the 50s, but it wasn't noticed. So by the time he published it, it the cat was kind of out of the bag. But the Fibonacci people hadn't noticed. And actually, Ed Berger has discovered recently that it was published in the 1920s, but in such an obscure way and in such an abstract way that even if you read it, you don't actually get it. So it was kind of uh, obscured. But it's a very nice fact. Well, how about six? If somebody says a total of six, six can only be written as five plus one. Now you say, what about three plus two plus one? The rules are you cannot use uh, consecutive numbers and you can't use a repeat. So for six to be three plus three in the card context, you'd need to have two threes. We don't want two threes because we wouldn't be quite sure, quite sure which suit was involved if only one of them turned up. And three plus two plus one is not an option with two cards. It would be an option if three were allowed. It's a little more complicated if you have somebody pick three cards. If you have somebody pick four cards or have four people pick cards, it seems more magical. But four is just as easy as two because all the five numbers, six numbers in question add up to 32. So if somebody, uh, if you have four people in the front row pick four cards and they say 22 is the total, you subtract 22 from 32 to get 10 and then you know 10, well the two and the eight are missing so you've got the other cards. You don't know the order but you can probably not get stuck with not knowing that. So 20 can be written uniquely as 13 plus 5 plus 2, and so on. And the general strategy is to peel off the biggest numbers. So if somebody said do it for 50, which is way beyond the reach of a deck of cards, uh, you would pick off the biggest Fibonacci number, which is 34. You're left with 16. It's not a Fibonacci number, but you can peel off 13, and then you get 3 and you're done. So 50 can be written in only one way as a sum of, three Fibon uh, as a sum of Fibonacci numbers where there's no repeats and no two that are beside each other in the sequence. So it's a very nice fact. So the trick. And again, you'll get a photocopy of this uh, as you leave today. Um, has, uh, you know, just use these cards. And I just picked a particular suit order that I memorized. So these six cards are planted at the top of the deck. And uh, off we go. So it's guaranteed to work. Now, I said it worked for three cards as well. Yes, 
most of the time. There's one slight problem. Remember I said all six numbers add up to 32? There are three of them that add up to 16, and that would be the king, the two, and the ace. The other three also add up to 16. So if somebody, if you have three people pick cards and they report a total of 16, it's the one ambiguous case. So you have to fish a little bit. Like, does one of you have an ace? And no matter what they say, you say, I knew it, or I knew you didn't have an ace. Or you say, does anybody have a heart? And they either say yes, or you say, what a heartless crowd you are, or whatever. So you have to fish for a little bit of information in the case of three. But it works for four as easily as two, as I mentioned, and so on. Of course, you can make it work for any number by only using five of the cards. If you only use five of the first fib six Fibonacci numbers, um, then it works for three beautifully. And it seems more magical. Four seems more magical. Five is magical, but you know in your heart that it's a cheat because you know, you know what the five cards are. So there's lots of possibilities. Now, what other numbers work apart from Fibonacci numbers? Well, the Lucan numbers are pretty good provided you drop the initial two. So the, Fib the Fibonacci numbers are, are a type of number pattern where you have two seeds at the beginning and then you add to get the next one. So if you start with a two and a one, you add and you get three. Add one and three, you get four. Three and four, you get seven and so on. You don't want to include the two, however because two plus three is the same as one plus four, and that would be a disaster if somebody said the total's five. So just leave the two off. A one, a three, a four, a seven, and a jack. Remember the 11 is a jack. That'll work beautifully, and they're not Fibonacci numbers. So somebody who says, oh, I've seen that trick, it's Fibonacci numbers, you do them with these numbers and they're stuck. They won't quite see what you're up to. Actually, you don't need numbers of the generalized Fibonacci type. One, two, four, six, and 10 works beautifully. No royal cards used. So does one, three, five, seven, and a king. So an interesting question is, what's going on here? What, what numbers do work? I mean, you know, Fibonacci numbers do, generalized Fibonacci's do, provided you always have an increasing sequence. But what's going on in general? Interesting question. So there's all sorts of simple, interesting questions you can generate by playing around with, with this kind of a trick. OK. For my next uh, trick, we will do something different. And this time, I would like a volunteer who is very keen on poker. Who likes poker? Somebody at the back who's feeling left out up there. Who likes poker? Somebody at the back who's not currently playing poker. Is there anybody who likes poker in the room? Excellent. Please join me. Come down. OK. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to have you shuffle these cards. And then I'm going to take off the top 10, which is enough for two poker hands. I'm going to take a peek at them, and I'm going to make a prediction. We could write it down, but in the interest of speed, I'll just say it verbally. You'll all remember it. He's an experienced card mixer, I can see. <laughs> and um, what's going to happen then is he's going to make all the decisions about which cards he gets and which cards I get. And I have a sneaking feeling that in spite of the free will he thinks he has, I think my prediction will come true. And it works with 10 random cards. He's shuffled the cards. You're good and shuffled? Well, why not? Thank you. OK. So what's your name? Brett. Brett. Excellent, Brett. OK. Hold on there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. OK. I have no idea what those cards are. I have no control. He shuffled. I'm now going to take a peek. And I hope there's no cameras behind me. Um, very interesting. OK. Do I have 10? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Oh, yes. OK. Hmm. OK. If he's lucky, he might get a straight. He might. But I have a sneaking feeling that I'm going to get three of a kind. And. Uh, Let's see how it works out. But he's going to make all the decisions. Are you ready? I'm not going to influence your mind or any way. OK. So the first card is for you, a uh, whole card. Uh, actually, one of these you get, one I get. Which one do you want, top or bottom? Bottom one. Bottom one for you, top one for me. OK. So he's made that decision. I don't know what they are. I have no influence. Now, you get to pick one of these. The other goes underneath. Would you like the top one or the bottom one? Uh, top one. Top one for you. The other one goes underneath. Pick another one for you, top or bottom? Bottom. Bottom. Now, in all fairness, I'm going to have him pick my cards, too. That's very fair. I'm such an honest person. Would you like to pick a card for me, top or bottom? Uh, top for you. Top for me. Pick another one, top or bottom? Bottom this time. Bottom. OK, another one for yourself? Bottom. Bottom. 
Another one for me. Bottom. Bottom. And then there's just one left each. Okay, so did you get your straight? Flip them over and see if you got it straight. Um, show them there for people so they can see what you, how you do. Put them under the camera so they'll see. Ooh, very close, very close, yeah. Well, he tried, I mean, you know. <laughs> so, uh, remember I said I get three of a kind? I wasn't too greedy, I mean, I could have asked for three kings. I was actually just happy to have uh, three twos. Thank you very much. <laughs>Ten random cards. It is possible to have ten cards with nothing of interest to a poker hand. After all, there are 13 different values in a deck. So if you handpick ten cards, you can make sure that there's no straights and no twos of a kind or threes of a kind or whatever. But that's not what we did here. I had him shuffle the deck. And it turns out there's a very high probability with a shuffle deck that the top ten cards have something of interest to a poker player. In this case, three twos. Secondly, I was able to control his brain. <laughs> well, was I? Let's take a look. So, this actually ties in with something that uh, is ta commonly taught in uh, classes involving statistics or probability. If we had the time, I would be prepared to bet 200 pounds right now that in this room, I said it, I'm not going to do it, but I would in general if we had time to check. I think there's probably two people in this room who share a birthday. And the reason is that there's quite a lot of people in the room. And you're looking around saying, well, no, there's not that many people. There's 365 different days in the year. But you only need 50 or 60 people to have a very high probability of a birthday match. And I'm talking about, you know, the 5th of June or whatever, not the year, but the month and the day. And that's very surprising, counterintuitive. Our intuition is very poor. Similarly, with cards, with 10 random cards, it turns out there's a very high probability of getting something of interest to a poker player. Not with five, but with 10. So let's take a look. So the question is, how many cards would you need uh, from a standard deck to have a more than 50% chance of getting something of interest, say a pair or better? And as I said, it's related, I'm gonna call it the birthday card match. It's related to a standard question called the birthday problem, which is how many people would you have to have in a room to have a greater than 50% ch chance of having a birthday match? The surprising counterintuitive answer is about 23. With 23 people, the odds are slightly in your favor that there'll be a birthday match. By the time you get to 60 people, it's over 99.9%. .9%. Even though there's 365 days a year, you could handpick 364 people who had different birthdays. But if you pick 364 people at random, I would bet you my life savings that there'd be multiple birthday matches. Very surprising. Our intuition is poor. Coincidences are inevitable. It would be more surprising if they didn't happen. So with people, it's 23. What's it with cards? Well, there's a standard little way of analyzing this. And actually, um, it turns out to be easier to figure out the number of ways where there wouldn't be a match and use a little probability argument that says the chances of something happening is one minus the chance that it doesn't happen. If the weather forecast says, you know, 30% chance of rain tomorrow, well, there's a 70% chance of no rain. So we're familiar with that idea of things adding up to one or 100% when you flip the perspective. So it turns out that this little formula here, it's about as advanced as we're going to get with Matt's formulas tonight, but this formula here is the one you need. This is one minus the probability that there aren't any matches for, you know, five cards, six cards, whatever. And if you plug in numbers, it turns out that with six cards, um, there's at least a 50% at least a, a chance. That's not too surprising if you're a poker player, because if you're a poker player, you probably know that there's a 50% chance of getting something of interest with five cards. The standard poker hand is five cards. There's 2.6 million poker hands, roughly. About 1.3 million of them have a pair or better. So with six, you go over 50%. But with 10 cards, it goes up to 98%. With 10 cards, randomly picked, not deviously picked, randomly picked. With 10 randomly picked cards, there is a 98% chance of at least a pair. Let's just quickly try it again. So that's the first element. The maths guarantees, with 98% chance, that there'll be stuff of interest. Then there's a second layer of deception, which is, you know, he thought he was making free decisions. We'll talk about that in a moment. So I'm going to take 10 cards off the other end. There's, there's two jacks. There's three more cards. There's another ace. That's eight cards. Well, there. We have two pairs in those 10 cards right there. Sorry, you can't see them all. There's two aces and two jacks there. Um, you know, it's, it's really kind of unusual to find 10 cards where there's nothing of interest. And if that happens, what are you going to do? Give them back and say, we can't play poker with this. 
please shuffle again. You're not going to be out of luck twice in a row. It's two percent or two percent chance. Unlikely. It's never happened to me. So you just have the person shuffle again. So there will be stuff of interest. Now, if I was handed these, I would panic slightly because um, the real question is control then. I, I looked at the cards and I pretend that I didn't know if there were 9 or 10. I did actually have a mild suspicion that I had miscounted, but that gave me an excuse to separate them and say, do I have enough cards here? I was rearranging them ever so slightly. When I regrouped them, I had the three twos where I wanted them, where I knew I would be sure to get them in spite of all his free choice. So what's going on there? Well, that's a different question. So the first thing is that um, you know, you want, you want to have the cards, uh, well, let me just explain it to you here in, in, a, in a way that maybe has nothing to do with poker. There were ten cards. What's really happening is the stuff I want has to be in the bottom four. The stuff you want your opponent to get is in the four above that. And the top two cards have to be irrelevant, as in they're not deal breakers. They won't change the balance of power. Because you do genuinely say to him, you know, or him or her, pick one of these for you, and you can even show them the cards. If I showed them those cards, they'd probably go for the ace. And that, you know, that would give them a feeling of confidence. But of course, there's no other aces in there that they're going to get their hands on. So, um. so the top two cards are not that interesting. It's, it's really about the eight cards below that. And forget about poker for a minute and think about color, because color is easier to track. Nice if we had another red card. So there are 10 cards, and they're face down, you know, but I already know kind of where the interesting stuff is. The stuff I want him to get, the uh, cards in position 3, 4, 5, and 6. The stuff I am going to get for sure is cards in position 7, 8, 9, and 10. Cards in position 1 or 2 are not deal breakers. Now, I'm going to show you what's really going on here with the cards face up, because it's a lot more obvious with the cards face up. And forget about poker, because we're not going to get into the nitty-gritty of poker. I want you to think about the fact that there would be two cards on top here. The person would pick one, you'd pick one. And then, well, there's four black cards followed by four red cards. He's going to get the black cards. I'm going to get the red cards, in spite of the free choices. And here's why. The cards are face down in reality, remember. But I basically say, which black card would you like? I'm giving a choice of the cards that were originally in position three or four. He picks one, you get the other one later. He picks one, you put the other one underneath. Then you say, pick another card. Well, he's doomed to get a card in position four or five, five or six, another black card. And then I say, well, why don't you pick my cards too? How convenient, because I want to get the red cards, right? So I say, uh, which one do I get? And of course, I get a red card, and then I say, pick another one for me. At that point, it's kind of descent, reverse induction. You went from eight down to four. It's about powers of two. Color separation. He picks one more. He picks one more for me. At the end, you just put them out like that, they're face down, no questions tend to be asked. Of course, I get the red ones, he gets the black ones. In reality, the bottom four cards wouldn't be about color. They'd be, in the case you just saw, the three twos that I wanted and something else that didn't matter. And I was a little worried that he might get a straight because I saw the seven, eight, nine, ten. I was thinking, oh boy, if he got a straight, that would nail me. So I just said, you know, maybe he'll get a straight. But, you know, there was a kind of a, maybe a one in four chance that he might have got a straight and it didn't quite come out. And if he got a straight, at least I wouldn't, I would have quasi predicted it. That's a great trick, and um, if you do that, I've done that late at night in bars where there's people who really play poker, and it freaks them out completely. <laughs> and people tend to ask me, you know, do I play poker? I'd never play poker with you. I don't play real poker at all. I'd be hopeless. This is kind of more interesting than poker, I think. It's different. Okay, in our last little section here, I would like to talk about something quite different. And um, I'm going to show you how a little more advanced mathematics can be used to do something pretty cool. This is the math card trick that introduced me to the topic. Uh, Paul Zorn, who uh, is an American mathematician, was at a conference 12 or 13 years ago and he said to me, have you heard of the five card trick? And I said, no, what's that? And I wasn't really interested in cards at the time. And he told me about its existence and immediately I was intrigued and I said, wait, wait, let me think about that. And he said, would you like me to tell you how it works? And I said, no, I want to think about this. So I went away and I thought about it for a few days. And it has become, you know, a lifelong obsession at this point. So I need two volunteers um, for this. You'd like to be one. OK, I need another volunteer. OK, come on down, please. Two of you. OK, what's your name? Uh, Francis. Francis. 
Welcome, Francis. What's your name? Joni. Joni? Jenny. Jenny. Well done, Jenny. OK, now I'd like you to mix up those cards, please. Mix those cards up. Mix, just shuffle them, mix them, make them all jumbled so we don't know where they are. I'm going to flash through, um, while she's doing that, the slides that explained in detail the color separation idea there. By the way, that, that trick was invented. The, the, uh, the color distribution, the 4-4 inevitability, was invented in 1964 by a man called Bill Simon, who wrote the second book on mathematical magic for the general public. The first book was written by Martin Gardner. Bill Simon was the best man at Martin Gardner's wedding. Okay, they're shuffled. Okay, I'd like you to give, Jenny, please give Francis any five cards you wish. I don't see anything. I'm going to watch here. So just give him any five cards. And you can put the rest on the table there so we don't forget them later. Okay. Any five cards. Okay, so Francis, you have five cards? Mix them up, whatever. Um, I don't know what they are. I'd like you to, um, you know, put one of them down here, face down on the table. Make sure it's face down so I can't see it. Apart from my x-ray vision. Mm. Okay, I'd like you to put the other four on display over there, please. Um, on the screen, you know, the, the projection system so everybody can see it. So there's a card there. My job is to figure out what that card is. Now, I, Jenny shuffled the cards. I never met you before. We haven't set this up. I mean, I have no idea what that card is. I couldn't possibly know what that card is. Um, oh, ready. Okay. So, okay, now the math comes in, so I have to think very hard. Um, okay, so. Um, hmm. I have a suspicion that that card is, let me double check. Um, uh, my first instinct is the Jack of Diamonds, but let me, let me just check the maths again. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going with the Jack of Diamonds. So if this was the Jack of Diamonds, would you be reasonably impressed? Oh, yeah. I know I would. <laughs> okay, is it the Jack of Diamonds? Thank you. Good job. Now, that's a pretty impressive, thank you very much, Jenny. That's a very impressive mathematics trick, and it really is mathematics. So I was introduced to this in January 1999, and uh, I said, Paul Zorn said to me, uh, this trick exists. And it turns out that Art Benjamin, who spoke here uh, back in March or so, is the man who popularized that trick in recent decades. It's been around since the late 1940s. And um, it was kind of forgotten. It was published in a very obscure book that was out of print for a long time. Martin Gardner referenced it a few times, but he never explained it. And uh, Art Benjamin rediscovered it in the mid-1980s and started popularizing it. And it's now quite well known. It's one of those tricks which is rumored to be used by employers looking for very smart uh, you know, job candidates like Microsoft and Google, they say that, you know, they give you a trick, they tell you about this and give you an hour to figure out how it could possibly work. And if you pass that test, then you have to jump over the alligators and so on. So, um, what's going on here? Five random cards. One is set aside, I'm showing the other four. Those four spoke to me and told me what the fifth <coughs> card is. How is that possible? What can you say for sure about five random cards? For sure, not with probability 99%, but for sure. Well, the two of the suits must be the same. Right, there's only four suits in a deck, at least the ones I play with. So there should be a suit match. And in fact, there was a suit match. There's the cards. Actually, the cards that Jenny gave Francis had two suit matches. There were two clubs and there were two diamonds. But there had to be at least one suit match. So that's the first key ingredient. So um, a lot of these uh, tricks are explained in terms of two people, Alice and Bob, and I got so tired of Alice and Bob that I decided to use A and B, the first two letters of the alphabet. So A-O-D-H is actually an Irish name pronounced A, very conveniently, and B you're familiar with. So uh, A uh, was, I guess, Francis, and Francis um, had somebody pick, uh, Jenny picked five cards, gave them to Francis. He uh, you know, gave one back, or it was concealed on the table, and then uh, Francis, playing the role of A, went over there and showed four for all of us to see. And as soon as I saw them, uh, I'm playing the role of B, I was able to determine what the card is. Okay. 
So this is that type of two-person mathematics. And in fact, this was the first trick that really got me into this subject. And I really liked it and wanted more and went back and read Martin Gardner and so on. And uh, over time, you know, more two-person tricks have been developed. But there's some sort of mathematical communication going on here. Well, as we said, um, no verbal or physical cues. I mean, you know, magicians do stuff where the spacing between the cards reveals a multitude. I don't do that kind of stuff. It's just honest to goodness. You could email somebody a list of these. You could tweet them and have somebody tweet back what the fifth card is. There are iPhone apps that do this. It's been around for a while. Actually, this was conceived as a telephone trick back in the late 1940s and published in 1950. It was called Telephone Stud. William Fitz Cheney, who was a mathematician, uh, the first person to get a PhD from MIT, as the man who invented this trick in its original form. Well, um, uh, as I said, uh, Francis was in on it from the get-go. I didn't mention that, did I? Francis isn't as innocent as he looks. Francis had practiced this trick before. Jenny was completely innocent, but Francis had practiced this trick. So Francis and I had a convention of communication, which we agreed upon in advance. And he followed that. First of all, he decided which card to hide, one of the suit matches. Secondly, he was very careful how to arrange the other four cards. So how could you arrange four cards to communicate the identity of the fifth, which could be any card in the deck? It seems a little tricky. Um, actually, um, in this particular case, the first card was the suit giver. Now, this was the card that was hidden, right? So when I saw this, uh, I actually, in this case, knew that it was a diamond. Now, it doesn't have to be the first card, but we'll talk about that a little later. It happened to be the first card there. So I knew it was a diamond. Well, that narrows it down to 13, well, actually 12 diamonds. That narrows it down to 12 things. Now, what can you do with four cards, which could be anything? Well, they can be rearranged in four factorial, which is you know, four times three times two, which is 24 ways. But they could be any card. So how are you going to communicate a definite number with them. Well, actually, if you think about it, the nine of diamonds has to be in that position. I, I'd said that that was the suit giver, so it's really the other three cards that are giving the information. And three cards can only be arranged in three times two, which is six ways. And that seems to be half of 12, because you have to narrow it down to one of the other 12. So you need an extra little, literally an extra bit of information. OK, so the first idea is, as we mentioned, that there has to be a suit match. Uh, without loss of generality, two clubs. In this case, we actually use the diamonds, but it could have been the clubs. So, um, and then there's a designated position for the suit giver. Um, but that still seems to uh, leave you with only six ways to communicate. So these can be arranged in different ways. And the actual arrangement of these, I had to decode in my head and figure out what number he was trying to tell me. Was he trying to tell me it was a jack? Yes, but not directly. It's a little more subtle than that. Um, first of all, given any three cards in the deck, you can think of the whole deck as having an order from 1 to 52. You can decide that the clubs come first, alphabetically, then the diamonds, then the hearts, then the spades. An ordering convention was agreed upon in advance. And if you have three random cards, one of them's on the left, one's in the middle, and one's on the right, roughly speaking, with respect to a, a spread of 52. So I call those low, medium, and high. And there's six ways to jumble those up. So, uh, but six doesn't seem to be enough because the other one could be any of the 12 clubs. But actually, when Francis decided to use this suit match, he had to make a decision. Was he going to hide this card and show me that one? Or was he going to hide this card and show me that one? And he made the right choice. There's 12 other cards in general. It could be of a, of a suit that you know. But how do you narrow it down to six? Well, if you think of a clock, we probably have a clock in the room. There's a clock. That's a 12-hour clock. A, a suit of cards can be thought of as a 13-hour clock. And just like the 12-hour clock has the property that if you take any two hours on it, they can't be more than six hours apart. The same is true for a 13-hour clock. It wouldn't be true for a 14-hour clock, but it's true for a 13-hour clock. A 13-hour clock, if you have any two values, any two values in a suit, they can't be more than six apart, depending on which direction you travel, of course. And that's the subtlety. So the third part, which is a little tricky, is that you consider them as a clock of 13 hours. And consider clockwise. I mean, the jack is 2 past the 9, because the jack is 11. Um, so uh, we're always, 
what he basically told me was add two to get from the nine up to the jack. If we'd had uh, you know, a, a three and a jack, those aren't the same suit, but both three and a 10 are the same suit. 10 is seven past the three. Seven's no good. I want to stick with six. But three is six past the 10 going the other direction. Because you go 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 16 is the same as three because you're subtracting 13. So if it says 10 and a three, if that's the only suit match, he would hide the three and play the 10. And then the low, medium, high stuff, you know, if you learn that off, it kind of communicates um, which numbers to, uh, to add. So there's a little more detail there. At the bottom here it says, you know, one corresponds to low, medium, high, two corresponds to low, high, high medium, and so on. I actually had to do add two, because the order in which he played them was, was low, high, medium, and I had to decode that in my head and, and check. He wants me to add two to the nine of diamonds, to be the jack of diamonds, and that's how it's done. So this is basically an old trick. What I want to do to finish up is tell you how it might work for something more sophisticated. What about four cards? If somebody gave you any four cards where there doesn't have to be a suit match, well, it's harder, but it can be done. With four cards where there doesn't have to be a suit match, it's possible to put one aside and show the other three in such a way that they tell the person what the other card is. So if we had four cards, and the, I just deliberately picked four of different suits. I need a diamond and a spade. So there must be a spade in here. Or do I have a spadeless deck? There's a spade. Okay, there's four cards of different suits. So with four cards of different suits, it's possible to hide one of them and display the others, maybe one of them face down, which appears to be less information. In email, this would be the first card is a nine of diamonds. I'm not going to tell you what the second card is. And the third card is the three hearts. So it's absence of information. Sounds bad. It's actually very good. And it might be that uh, two of them are face down, which is to say, I'm not telling you, not telling you, three of hearts. Your job is to identify the fourth card. And it actually works if all three cards are face down. <laughs> I promise you. Thank you very much for your attention. A um, <coughs> burst of time for any questions, other than how do you do it for four cards. Uh, and then uh, Colin will be hanging around uh, if you have any uh, pressing uh, questions you don't want to share in front of everyone else. Any magic questions of a personal nature, you can come down. <laughs> and don't, don't take any proposition bets he may offer you. Uh, so are, are there any questions? Uh, do I make mother-in-laws disappear? No. <laughs> and that concludes... Uh, or, I mean, I'm going to ask her, he doesn't afford me, How can you use these in gambling? How can you use these tricks in gambling? Well, I, I don't know if you can, but um, there's a very good magic book came out about two years ago written by two people, Ron Graham and Percy Diaconis. Percy Diaconis is an expert statistician who knows a lot about magic. He has been hired by Las Vegas to uh, check. They have shuffling machines now that they trusted because somebody said we programmed it right and they don't do a very good job of randomizing decks and people, people were able to take advantage of that and they hired him and paid him a lot of money <coughs> to fix the shuffling machines so that they were more fair. So there is money to be made if you understand the statistics but I think, um, you know, I can't promise you a career in, in gambling that will make a profit but if you're a statistician you can get hired to uh, help check that things are really random. So the only way to make money in a casino is to be hired by the casino. <laughs> <laughs> but we knew that. <laughs> we did. I find actually knowing too much math can be a distraction, particularly in poker, because I spent half my time working out all the possible probabilities. And if I just looked up and saw my opponent was sweating, I'd realize <laughs> a lot more information. So it, it's a balance of the two. Any, any other questions? So, so, so the last uh, trick you showed, I think is I think you can do much better than, uh, uh, as you also said, you know, than uh, just for 52 cards. Right. That I think, I think 124. 124, yeah. The um, is that last trick was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. no, you can do it with a bigger deck. Yeah, but a deck of 124 and, cards. And 124, most importantly, is more than twice 52. So what you can do is the following. You can have, you, I could have said to Jenny, um, pick five cards and toss a coin. Uh, 
Francis would have seen whether the coin was heads or tails, would have shown me four cards, and I would have identified the fifth card and correctly identified whether, whether a head or tail had come up. You can code more information, up to 124 card deck, yeah. But the, the, the four card trick is just, just, just nicely works, and there's actually a three card version which I'm giving a talk on uh, in a month. Uh, um, give, me, give me any three cards, um, I can display all three of them, one of them face down, possibly many of them face down in such a way that my lovely assistant can identify the face down card. And it's math based. Is that in your book? It's not, it's fresher, it's newer than the book. Oh, it's don't bother buying the book. <laughs> <laughs> With PR agents like this, who needs <laughs> Buy the book, and then also buy the next book. Uh, yes, question. Yeah, you mentioned these script uh, cards. Where do you get the previous ones? Is that, is, is, are they available to? So where can we get the old epigram? That's it. Well, um, I have uh, lots of copies. There, there's two tables at the back. By the way, the, the handout with this, is that now available? Uh, yes, so uh, we have my one? dear friends at the back, they're in a green bag, uh, just behind the bag, they're available on the way out. So you can find It'll be a white piece of paper rather than yellow. But in addition to that, there are c extra cards at the back. I have, I have several hundred here, so if you want a few. Um, I, can o I only have spare copies of the one that says puzzle, uh, this one. Um, this, this one that says magic is last year's, and I just, I just have one or two of those for demo purposes. But this is new. This was printed two weeks ago. Has not been released yet. It's for this October. And if you Google ambigram, uh, it's a shortened version for ambiguous gram. Terrible use of maths. If you look up ambigram, then there is a decent amount online about them. Yeah, the guy who invented it, uh, who still does stuff like this, his name is Scott Kim. And he, uh, he has a website which has wonderful creations along these lines. Actually, I'll let you in on a secret. Scott Kim has designed a prototype Google Doodle web page, a highly interactive one, with one activity for each letter in the word Martin Gardner that we're hoping they'll run, if not this year, on Martin's 100th birthday, which will be next year. We are trying to build momentum worldwide so that Google will have no choice but on the 21st of October, 2014, to honor the 100th birthday of Martin Gardner by having this thing where if you click on A, it'll be Alice in Wonderland, you pick on G, it'll be games, and M, it'll be magic, and so on. And Scott has helped us design that. He's, he's a phenomenal graphic artist and magician and musician and so on. Any questions left? That's okay. Uh, Colin will be uh, loitering down the front if you do wish to come down and see him very quickly. And uh, I'm sure he'll be performing the ball bearing rolling down the slope <laughs> uh, which did, was work genuinely. I saw it working uh, before the show. It, it was absolutely spectacular. Um, and we, we, here we go. So this is it. <laughs> okay. One third of the way there. I think the gravity is stronger in that direction. Ah, that won't go at all. <laughs> you can't see, but it really is a downhill uh, slope. It's good to know that a Queen Mary gravity is not. <laughs> it actually flows this way. On that note, we're going to wrap up here with a huge final round of applause for Colin. Thank you.